is a webinar on the economic benefits of historic preservation with Dorothy Guzzo from the New Jersey Historic Trust. Um, we welcome back Dorothy. She was here um, about six months ago. Um, uh, we love to talk about New Jersey and particularly the Highlands cultural resources with Dorothy because she's she has a um, very storied career here in New Jersey. Um, she was appointed executive director of the New Jersey Historic Trust in, in 2008. And before that, Dot Guzzo served <laughs> as the deputy state historic preservation officer for the state of New Jersey. And as uh, the federally recognized state historic preservation office, she oversaw the New Jersey and the National Registers of Historic Places. Prior to her appointment um, to SHPO in 1985, uh, Dot was employed by the same department as the grants and the project manager, overseeing the restoration and development of state-owned historic sites. Um, Ms. Gu Ms. Guzzo, or Dot, has more than 21 years of government experience in historic resource stewardship. Um, Dot previously served as uh, on the not-for-profit board of directors for the Crossroads of the American Revolution Association. She is also ex officio of the New Jersey Historical Commission, um, New Jersey Historic Trust, and Main Street, New Jersey. And she was the past chair of the Alice Hall Institute. She has held elected office, served on her municipal planning board and local historic preservation commission. Dot is currently serving on the New Jersey Historic Tourism Task Force, and she is charged with creating heritage tourism master plan for the state of New Jersey. And Dot, I hope I'm uh, reading a current um, um, bio. We welcome you back. I'm glad to have you here and um, hello. Thank you, Elliot. I hate introductions because I hope you didn't set everyone's expectations up too high. Um, it is a Tuesday night after all, but tonight I'm going to focus on the benefits of historic preservation, but primarily why preservation is good for the economy. Um, as you mentioned, the Historic Trust is the primary funder of historic preservation in the state. We award grants to nonprofit organizations and governmental entities um, to preserve historic sites that are most often visited by the public. And we also fund public buildings that are used by everyone, like a courthouse or municipal building or a train station. Um, if you were to poll people, uh, they would probably say that the primary benefit to preservation is that we're preserving history, an intangible attribute. And we do it because it's the right thing to do and we're Americans and it's a way to connect us with our history. Um, and with the past. And all of that is true, of course, but there's also a very real benefit um, to the economy that I wanna share with you. Here's why we preserve. Typically, I would have civic pride to be number one on the list, but for tonight, I dropped it to number two. Historic sites, historic districts, local landmarks are all connections with the, and the connections with the environment all make your community a desirable place to live. Your history and how that history is reflected in the built environment, uh, contributes to your individual identity and your civic identity and the pride that you have for your town. Preserving your sense of place is the continuity and tangible link between the past and the future. In preservation terms, historic sites are unique. No two are exactly alike. So when a special place is lost to demolition and worse, if it's by neglect, it kind of hurts a bit. So if you've ever mobilized to try and prevent a demolition or to try to promote a preservation, uh, promote preservation aside from it being too late. One of the primary obstacles often is it costs too much. Um, it costs too much to save. It's too much to preserve, too much to maintain. So I'm gonna try and deconstruct some of that. When talking economic benefits, there are project specific uh, details that redevelopers, for example, use to determine whether a project is a go or no go. Typically, private developers are in the business to make money and there's a bottom line. So does the project make economic sense. Um, how is economics measured? 
just so you don't think I'm all that smart, <laughs> there's one person in our field who pioneered the messaging about economics of preservation way back in the 80s. And he's been authoring the various studies around the country. And we typically use his studies papers and the books he's published um, to be our economics Bible. So I'm quoting from Donovan Ripka. And he says that economics is measured in three ways, jobs created, increase in household income, and demand created in other industries. And good news, preservation hits all three of these. In brief, heritage tourists spend more, more per day, stay longer, and visit more places than tourists in general. There's a crisis in affordable housing in New Jersey and throughout the country, and that crisis will not be solved in the foreseeable future without saving and reinvesting in our older and historic homes at a level far greater than is taking place today. Virtually every example of sustained success in downtown revitalization, regardless of the size of the city, has included historic preservation as a key component of the strategy. There is no form of economic development of any kind, anywhere, on any level that is more cost effective and that is better able to leverage scarce public resources than the preservation-based commercial revitalization approach known as Main Street. This is a picture of Bernardsville because they are our latest Main Street town. They've just been added to Main Street. We're pretty excited about this. This is the first announcements of new Main Street towns in probably a decade. So it's very exciting. Um, and to go on to quote from Donovan, there is no credible evidence whatsoever that local historic districts reduce property values. In the vast majority of cases, properties subject to the protections of local historic districts experience rates of property appreciation greater than the rest of the local market and greater than similar undesignated neighborhoods. Generally, worst case is that values of properties within a local historic district move in tandem with the local market as a whole. For anyone serving on a local historic preservation commission, you are performing a great service. Having an ordinance designating property that should be preserved, creating guidelines, having a process for review and approval means predictability and protection. Property values stabilize or increase if you know your investment is going to hold its value. And predictability is a key factor. Historic district designation helps to protect you from your neighbor, or sometimes it protects you from governmental action. Your neighbor's neglect or inappropriate alterations can ne negatively impact the investment you've made on your own home. So in a very real sense, while those serving on local commissions are not often thanked, and certainly anyone serving on a public board is underappreciated for the time and energy that you give, local commissions are doing a huge service to the community. So again, quoting from my personal hero in economics on the topic, I'm going to say that economics is the science that deals with the production, distribution, and consumption of wealth and with the various related problems of labor finance taxation. Economy is the careful management of wealth, resources, avoidance of waste by careful planning and use, thrift, or thrifty use. Economize is to use or manage with thrift or prudence to avoid waste or needless expenditure to reduce expenses. And here on the right side is the definition for preservation. The careful management of a community's historic resources, avoidance of wasted resources by careful planning and use, the thrifty use of those resources to use or manage those historic resources with thrift or prudence to avoid their waste or needless expenditure to reduce expenses through the use of those historic resources. So moving on, the connection between historic preservation and economic benefits seems very clear to me. New Jersey was the first to conduct an actual study to determine the economic impact of historic preservation. The study was done by the Center for Urban Policy Research at Rutgers University in the late 90s. More than 20, it's probably closer to 30 states at this point, have done similar studies in their states, and they've adopted the model that Rutgers developed as part of our study. What were some of the key impacts of this study? So, the substantial economic impacts from the study estimated that for an annual $123 million in statewide historic rehabilitation can be translated using this input output model into multiplier effects into the New Jersey economy. I am not an economist, um, so, um, but I take his word for it. Um, basically, the 123 million turns into 2,300 new jobs, 81 million in income, more than 15 million in state and local taxes, and 116 million in gross domestic product. While the study is ancient, the 
the input output model is very valid. So as costs rise, so does the economic impact. So to use a simpler example, for every $5 million that the historic trust awards to projects in the state of New Jersey, we leveraged benefits of about $247 million in wealth to the state. Over $222 million of this wealth is in income, while 6,200 person years of work are created. So the study originally was done by the trust to justify and illustrate the economic benefits of the trust programs. However, the methods that Rutgers designed have application to any rehabilitation project. When I am often called on to write justifications for our program, I conservatively, conservatively estimate that the trust leverages at least as much in private philanthropy and non-state money as they do in actual state dollars that are expended. We're a matching grant program and costs of projects typically come in higher than initial estimates. And here's the larger picture of economic return. For every million dollars spent on non-residential historic rehab, you create two more jobs than the same money spent on new construction. And it also generates $79,000 more in income and $13,000 more in taxes and $111,000 more in wealth than new construction. So preservation in New Jersey creates 21,575 jobs each year and 10,000 of them are in the state. So, Again, getting back to the study, preservation generates 263 million in income for New Jerseyans and 572 million nationwide. And it stimulates 298 million in federal, state, and local taxes in New Jersey and 415 million in taxes nationwide. New Jersey's historic properties contribute $120 million annually in property taxes, an amount that increases when historic rehabilitation enhances property values. Preservation contributes 543 million in gross state product and 929 million in gross domestic product. So these quantifiers represent the total value at retail prices of all the goods and services produced by a state's or nation's economy during a given period of time and our broadest available measure of economic activity. So rehabilitation work is a substantial component of New Jersey's construction industry, especially in our older cities and suburbs. Nationally, rehabilitation represents about 20% of all construction, but in New Jersey, it is twice that. We're an older state, we have older buildings, that would be expected. While historic rehab accounts for just 2.6% of all construction in New Jersey, it contributes 6.6% in urban areas and 5% immature suburbs. So this concentration suggests that there is a very vital role that preservation is playing in the state's most densely populated communities. So um, this slide is telling us that preservation creates more income for every million dollars spent than either highway construction or new construction. The true picture of economics is measured by the dollar spent, triggering a chain reaction throughout the economy, benefiting everyone from the construction worker to the taxpayer. Restoring a rotting wood, wooden porch on a historic house goes way beyond the direct impacts, such as the carpenter's paycheck and the lumber store's cash register. It is also felt by the lumberjack who chopped the tree down and by the farmer who grew the tree, the truck driver who hauled the wood to the lumber mill, and then the hardware store who stocked and sold the lumber, sold the nails and any preservative or paint, the coffee shop that served lunch to the carpenter and his workers while they were fixing the porch, and the neighbors in surrounding houses who may enjoy enhanced property values. It also benefits the town, which may collect more in property taxes as the improved house rises in market value making the tax burden a bit lighter for everyone else. And that's why economists use multipliers in determining economic benefits, because it's not just the actual dollar cost of a rehab project. And this chart demonstrates that example, the types of jobs that are created or sustained by historic rehab. Obviously construction and manufacturing are at the top of the list with services and retail jobs coming in next. So, just to sum all these calculations, bear with me. I know this isn't exciting, um, but by the multipliers in the study, the 123 million that I mentioned in the beginning that was spent on historic rehab in any given year is turned into $526 million in the way of jobs, income taxes, and wealth. Intuitively, we know that preservation is good and makes sense. And what I've just given you is the backup justification for making the statement. The federal government recognized way back in the 70s when um, recognized this way back, 
when they created the rehabilitation tax credit for income producing property. The way to keep and encourage history in our communities is to meddle with the tax code. A very wise person once told me that the government is really inefficient at doing most things for itself. But the one thing it is really, really good at is taxation. So if you want to effectuate an outcome, you mess with the tax code. And the very first version of the rehab tax credit was um, allowing 25% of the cost of rehabilitation to offset your taxes. But in 1986, the Congress amended the bill and passed the Tax Reform Act to overhaul the Internal Revenue Services Tax Code. The rehab um, credit survived, but was reduced to 20%. And they also made it so that the credit was only able to offset income from active income, not passive income, except if you were in the real estate business. So while the credit is still wildly popular, much of the work was syndicated, meaning the value of the credit is now sold to developers. The federal ITC was an enormous boom for historic preservation. It increased and diversified the types of listings that we have in the National Register of Historic Places. And prior to this, industrial buildings were not often considered for listing in the register. And because the projects were being reviewed and had to meet standards, there was a resurgence in tradespeople who relearned traditional building crafts, like how to test mortar, how to repoint mortar, repairing wood windows, plaster repair and restoration, stained glass restoration, and basic carpentry skills. And financially, the tax credit was the incentive that engaged the development community into reuse. When the latest reform package was passed in Congress, and I wanna say this was just two, 20, uh, 2018, the tax credit again survived, but became a little less lucrative. So the credits now have to be taken over a five year period using 44% per year, instead of being able to use the full 20% credit when, in one year. The result of the change is that the credit pricing from tax credit investors has dropped some, making the credits a bit less valuable. So as an example, if Sherwin-Williams is looking for projects to invest in to reduce their tax liability for one single year by 20%, they have to invest in five projects rather than just one. So what's up in New Jersey? Last winter, the governor signed an omnibus bill that included incentive programs and tax credits to induce economic growth and stability to our warbling economy. One of those was the rehabilitation tax credit for historic property. The rules are in development as we speak, but what we do know is that it will be administered by the Economic Development Authority in cooperation with the State Historic Preservation Office. The sites um, to use the credit must be historic and listed in the New Jersey Register of Historic Places and the projects must meet the preservation standards. It will be a competitive process, unlike the federal tax credit. Um, and 50 million per year has been allocated. So if your project comes in and they've already allocated the 50 million, you would have to wait till the following year. Um, and I think the program is in place for five years at that level. And like the federal tax credit, it is for only for income producing property, not residential. The law requires that projects use prevailing wage, which was of a concern, um, which is different from the federal credit. And to compensate, the credit was raised to 40%. Projects will need to show a gap in financing to be eligible for the state credit. And it can be combined with other credits like a Brownfields remediation credit. And presumably it can also be combined with federal credit once everybody figures out how this is gonna work. EDA has now hired staff and the regulations are being worked on. And last I heard, um, the version should be available near the end of this year. Uh, it hasn't been used yet, but think of how that's gonna change those statistics that I gave. Um, probably a good time to update that study is after a couple of years of having a state tax credit. Um, we've now joined the ranks of about 38 states who have state tax credits, um, hopefully to mirror the federal credit, including Maryland, Pennsylvania, and New York. And that's good because if you were a developer specialized in historic rehabilitation, you were not coming to New Jersey for your project. So we were actually losing out by not having this. Passage of the state credit was the missing piece of the preservation toolkit in New Jersey. We had a fairly strong enabling legislation and regulatory power. We have local preservation commissions enabled through our municipal land use law. We have funding from the historic trust, but the tax credit now allows us to be competitive in the redevelopment market. Another way to measure economic impact is through tourism. Tourism 
is the um, third largest revenue generator in New Jersey. It's possibly the fourth, depending on how you count government. And it's hard to think about New Jersey as a tourism mecca, but the Jersey Shore is definitely a mecca for tourism. But that's not all we have besides the beach. Since the Historic Trust predominantly finances restoration for sites that are visited by tourists, we commissioned a study to look at the economic impact of heritage tourism in New Jersey. The results came out just as the recession was hitting, so it wasn't publicized very much, but the, um, the results were pretty amazing. Um, first, I just want to start with what is heritage tourism? It's traveling to experience the places and activities that authentically represent the stories of people of the past, and it includes historic, cultural, and natural resources. Um, that's a definition that the National Trust for Historic Preservation developed. And typically, we talk about a tourist as someone who travels more than 50 miles for a tourism experience. It, heritage tourism differs from regular tourism in that it is generally authentic and educational, and it can also be fun. We found that 8% of all tourism revenue can be attributed to heritage tourism. That means without even trying and no central marketing, our historic sites are positive revenue generators. If you only remember one thing that I said this evening, remember that 8% of all revenue generated by tourism can be attributed to our wonderful, colorful, and diverse collection of historic sites. As part of the state's heritage tourism master plan, we surveyed our historic sites to see if they were visitor ready. And we use three basic criteria for visitor ready. Are you open regular hours? Are you actively promoted as an attraction? And do you fit into one of the six themes that we identified in the Heritage Tourism Master Plan? What we found wasn't all that surprising. Um, out of the 1,800 sites in district survey, just 18% met some or most of the criteria. 5% met most of the criteria. But the most important thing was most sites aren't open on Sundays which is when people want to visit. And that's just not good if you want to market your history to people that are coming 50 miles away. Um, a national study that was done by Mandela Associates took a look at the type of visitors who considered themselves and self-identified as the cultural heritage traveler. The study found that the cultural heritage traveler travels more frequently, prefers travel to be educational, spends more on activities, will travel farther to get the experiences that they seek, and most importantly to New Jersey and to the Highlands, is they are likely to combine activities like visiting historic sites with cultural activities and recreation. Now, 71% of the US population travels for leisure, and out of that, 70%, 76% of the leisure travelers participate in cultural and heritage activities. Again, as I said, they spend more for trip than non-heritage travelers. They contribute $171 billion to the U.S. economy. Um, we have to keep in mind that these statistics, of course, are all pre-pandemic. With many places closed in the past year, we know there will be a marked decline in heritage tourism revenue. I searched but couldn't find any new real data on this to report, but I expect that some will come out soon. And I think there's hesitancy because we're still reporting high numbers of hospitalizations, which impacts enthusiasm for tourism. Also, um, many docents and the volunteers at our sites are older and the first population to have felt the impacts of COVID. So the concern is real and sites have had to deal with getting safety precautions in place to provide a safe visit for both the visitors, the staff and the volunteers. Um, it is, has been interesting uh, to see the pivots that these sites have made, how much went virtual in just a short amount of time. And I understand that some sites will continue with virtual programming even after they're up and running again because they were able to draw new audiences. They were able to reach longer distances. Sites also um, came up with many creative ways to continue their mission, like holding outdoor concerts, for example. Um, so the big picture of tourism, it contributes over $40 billion to New Jersey's economy. I, I think that number went up with last year's tourism report. I think that's probably over 50 at this point. For every 160 visitors to New Jersey, one job is created and the return on investment is huge. For every dollar spent, $315 is returned to New Jersey coffers in one way or another. Um, and the results of our study um, to determine the economic and fiscal impact of heritage tourism in New Jersey, we use the same consultant that the state uses for their tourism because we wanted to make sure we weren't showing any sort of bias. Um, they found 11 million visits uh, to historic sites. 
Uh, we can account for $2.8 billion in visitor spending. Heritage Tourism supports 38,000 jobs and $715 million is returned to federal, state, and local taxes. And most importantly, 8% of the state's total tourism revenue can be attributed to heritage tourists. So in addition to measuring visitation at specific sites, the study calculated visitation to historic places like Lamperville or Stockton or Cape May or Ocean Grove, places that people visit because of its ambiance and because they like to shop and because they're combining it with recreation. And of course, they enjoy history. Direct visitor spending came to 134.5 million through admissions, food and beverages, and in other purchases that are made. Um, I should mention that tourists are basically uh, determined, I said in the beginning, by a traveling of 50 miles to visit. And that would describe the out of town visitor. Local residents, interestingly, spend about 71.7 million and out of town visitors spend 62.8 million. And that is interesting because usually it's flipped in other states. This is key to us because we know that historic sites are primarily being supported by their neighbors. And it's good to know that we value and support our historic sites, but it also says to me that if we wanted to grow our revenue, we need to attract tourists or those that travel more than 50 miles to visit. And that's the growth potential. This is just a quick breakdown of where the taxes come in and what the estimates were. So one of the recommendations that came out of the Heritage Tourism Master Plan is um, trying to, um, to optimize and trying to create a place where you can learn about the things to do in New Jersey. So we created Journey Through Jersey um, as a website to showcase the ama amazing historic sites that we have. Ultimately, our goal is to be the go-to site for visiting sites in New Jersey. And in order to come up on the site or be posted, we're using the visitor ready criteria are you open regularly? Do you actively market and promote your site? Do you fit into one of the six themes for interpretation? Um, there is an ability to search on the site by geographic area, but it's not solely categorized by the Highlands region. Um, we know we have some checking now to do post pandemic um, as the hours for many sites got reduced or were changed. Um, so we know we have to go through the sites and do another survey of some of that, um, which is just unavoidable. Um, just, just as a part of my commercial, um, we are the one source you can come to for heritage tourist, tourism funding. Um, we offer very small grants to foster tourism, $5,000 non-matching, and that comes out of our license plate uh, uh, grant prop pot. We also offer $50,000 planning grants for various heritage tourism activities. Our key phrase in this is linkage. We encourage attractions to work together to create interesting destinations and experiences. Typically when cultural heritage travelers travel, they do a number of things. They usually don't come just for one site. They're usually coming or staying overnight and they're looking for a collection of things to do, even if it's shopping or even if it's, you know, a historic hotel or bed and breakfast or something, they're usually coming for um, an experience, not just a visit. Um, as um, I was saying a little bit earlier, we uh, surveyed some sites and, well, surveyed sites and found out that one of the things they would really like to have help with is, is creating that visitor readiness. So in our construction pot, we will also fund um, amenities like bathrooms or parking lots or trails and bus turnarounds, things that make it easier for people to come and visit. Um, through feedback, we've come to realize that uh, restoring the site Preserving the authenticity is now just one aspect to encouraging visitors to come. They also want gift shops, cafes, and they want to combine other activities um, as part of their travel. Uh, the Division of Travel and Tourism also offers grants to destination marketing organizations. Those are usually on a regional basis, primarily for marketing, um, typically regional marketing or industry type marketing. Um, as an example, Visit South Jersey actively markets many wineries in South Jersey, along with promoting their historic uh, sites to visit. A municipality or county can apply for these grants, as well as any nonprofit organization. Um, and you can be a history organization or a tourism organization to take advantage of these, these pots of money. Um, I mentioned those $5,000 uh, fostering heritage tourism. That's all coming out of the Discover New Jersey History License Plate Fund. 
Um, wearing the Discover New Jersey history license plate is also good commercial on your car to advertise your support for the cause. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't advertise our plate. All the money goes directly back into grants. And so it's kind of a, a small pot, but it does help people get, get started for certain projects. If you're interested in any more of the details of any of those boring statistics I gave, our um, economic and fiscal impacts of heritage tourism is posted on our website and you can read the full report there. I'm also happy to report that we are about to engage the consultants again to take a look at the um, um, what heritage tourism has done in the last decade so we can measure whether we've uh, had any success or not. So we're about to go forward with that. I hope the results will be out in spring before the um, tourism season starts. I am going to end at this point and invite Elliot back um, so that we can um, have a conversation. Great. Dorothy, you, you, Dot, you get an A for featuring sites in the Highlands. Um, in, in, in your talk, I recognize the, um, the current headquarters of the Lake Apakong Foundation, which is the former landing train mm -hmm. station. Um, I saw the Booton Diner on Main Street here in Booton. Mm -hmm. um, the Bernardsville Episcopal Church, where our executive director, Julia Summers, is a warden. And um, I saw the Ford Fish House in Rockaway. And I believe that was the... Um, Greenwood Lake Airport with, with the um, plane. So thank you for featuring the Highlands in that. You know, the case really can easily be made for the economics of, of heritage tourism. Here in Bhutan, our, you know, which is a very historic town with um, the remnants of the former Bhutan Ironworks, which is a very large operation at the time and really, um, is why there is a town here today on, on Main Street. Um, and of course, the, they came here and had, a, and had the ironworks because the Mars Canal was routed through Bhutan as well, to the Bhutan Gorge. And so our objective here in Bhutan is to get people to Main Street to spend the day and then um, you know, see, see the sites that we've interpreted and um, then spend some money on our Main Street and help develop that economy. You know, and I am the chairman of the Bhutan Historic Preservation Commission. We're one of the few in Morris County that actually has enabling ordinances where um, even signage or more importantly, facade changes in our Main Street Historic District has to be re re reviewed and uh, approved by us uh, because as you know, private property isn't necessarily protected through being listed on the state or national registers of historic places. It takes a municipality to actually adopt enabling ordinances. And what I found that has made historic um, preservation and interpretation such a attractive um, project for people in Bhutan is, is the sense of place and the sense of pride it brings, which doesn't necessarily have an economic value, but it really touches people in, in very important ways. And it's, it's a sense of pride about where they live or, or, or where they work. And there's great opportunity there. Um, but I think what people are afraid of is the regulations that they have to come under, which restricts their opportunities to develop. And you know that, that scares a lot of people off. But we only have had success stories. And, and, and I'll give you a quick example. Um, we have a, 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 a burlesque theater, um, the mm -hmm. Bhutan Opera House, which actually inside still has a proscenium stage and you know, Burns and Allen performed there. And the owners of that came to us with a plan to uh, re renovate the facade. And they brought a really nice looking, very, very um, handsome looking design, but it wasn't historic. And we had to deny them. And, you know, I just saw that, you know, this is probably going to lead to litigation. It's not going to be a, a good scene, 
but they agreed to work with us. And they ended up, we ended up with a plan that was historically accurate according to what this, what we knew this building looked like. Um, it wasn't the exact materials, but it was materials that did accurately reflect what was once there. And it, it ended up, they say, the owners, with a better design, a design that, that, that they much prefer than their original one, and they saved money. And here we have an accurately restored um, uh, opera house in the center of our town. And what a great success story. We'd just like to see more of that. A, a question I have for you, you mentioned that um, through um, historic standards, historic preservation, there's actually opportunities to um, meet a municipality's historic um, affordable housing obligations. Can you give an example of um, adaptive reuse of former buildings that were um, used to meet that obligation successfully? So um, oftentimes, um, because uh, the Historic Trust is located in the Department of Community Affairs, which is also affiliated with HMFA, which is Housing Finance Mortgage, I'm gonna get the initials wrong. HMFA is our funder for things like affordable housing and for senior citizen housing. Oftentimes when those projects are funded using state money, they are redeveloping an existing building. And there's a lot of industrial type buildings that have been converted. Industrial buildings are the easiest thing to convert into apartments. I mean, once you get rid of contamination, but um, because they're open spaces on the inside. And so they, they can very easily be cut up into apartments um, and for other multi-uses. So um, one of my favorite projects is the Maiden Form factory in Bayonne. Um, Maiden Form was where they made bras and during World War II where they were making um, things for uh, soldiers. They converted into making underwear for soldiers to send overseas, overseas during World War II. Um, but the factory was turned into senior citizen housing. So it continues to be a site that's associated with women's history because there were two wonderful women who are associated with the uh, Maiden Form company. That's another lecture, but anyway, but the building itself now houses a brand a brand new use. And I do think that if you go there, you can you would know that. I think they have some sort of marking on there as a site that's associated with women's history. So um, industrial buildings are always good for doing that. There's another project that I love um, and it's way out of the Highlands area. Area, but it's down in Salem where there were a, an entire a drug infested, dilapidated, small houses, very old, a whole neighborhood of this. And a developer came in and through a series of um, some of it, the city owned um, either through eminent domain or tax foreclosures um, and some of it. So they turned this area over to the developer. And when he developed these houses, they did all kinds of things like they kept all the exteriors intact, but they actually were able to fur out walls and added insulation so that these houses were not gonna be a drain on anybody um, of, a, of a, a level that was um, needing some sub assistance. So some of the houses ended up being sold off for private development or to a homeowner, but some of them also um, stayed in the rental area. And this, this was down in uh, Salem. And it's a whole neighborhood filled with these uh, row houses, essentially, that one developer took and did this and kept it as affordable housing, even after they were done rehabbing. So it is possible to do this. The state does have lots of other programs to help with that. Um, HMFA is one of the biggest funders, I think, in the state for doing that. Um, so so it is it is entirely possible. And like I said, in the case in South Jersey, one of the things that was so interesting about it was that they incorporated um, a lot of, um, I'm gonna say the word gimmicks, but that's not what I mean, um, in order to get insulation and in order to get the R values in there, um, in order to make these houses sustainable over time so that they weren't going to be a drain, so that these people weren't going to be moving into drafty old houses or anything. And they did this while meeting the Secretary of Interior Standards and the developer was able to take a tax credit, um, a historic rehabilitation tax credit. So it is entirely possible. But most of the, the types of things that I see that do that are larger scale buildings. Um, the industrial buildings that are used or the apartment buildings that are converted back. Yeah, like an old mill building or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, have a question from uh, Joe Beck, who's the chair of the West Milford Historic Preservation Commission. What advice do you have for um, town preservation officers working with state and county departments 
to make sure preservation objectives are mutual and communities do not make adversaries of state agencies. <laughs> That's a, that is a mouthful. Um, all, often it is, it is about communication. Um, it's about sitting everybody down and trying to get everybody's interests out on the table so that you can see where you have common ground and where you really do have conflict. Um, I'm not exactly sure there's probably an example back there that he's dying to tell me about, which that would make my advice a little easier. Um, but, you know, nothing's easy <laughs> in the beginning. And oftentimes what the problem is, is understanding. Um, I know sometimes uh, historic preservation commissions have trouble with their zoning officer, the person that's supposed to be enforcing their uh, decision making. and what really needs to happen is for them to be sitting down and having a dialogue so that the zoning officer is understanding what the goals of the commission are and why they ruled what they did. And also not being afraid to ask the commission, what is it that you meant by this? You know, what is it that I'm supposed to be enforcing? So that's that's one area of concern um, oftentimes. And the same thing with relationships between boards, between the commission and say the planning board or the zoning board in town, they often don't talk to one another, so they're not really understand, even though there's supposed to be a municipal master plan where all of this comes together and you're supposed to have a general vision for your community, but sometimes there's a breakdown and it's often in, in just not understanding or having um, just preconceived ideas of what things are or not. Are not. Um, so probably better if there was a specific example, I could probably like give you better some better advice on that. Well, I, you know, I, I could see that there could be conflicts arising with um, a municipal preservation commission and or their, their um, objectives and the State Department of Environmental Protection and permitting requirements. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what exemptions there might be available for historic preservation. So in, when you say environmental protection, are you talking about a land use permit as opposed to yes. the Historic Preservation Office? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, depending on what the nature of the land use permit is, some land use permits do um, get flipped over into the Historic Preservation Office for review. There, there sometimes is a requirement to have a historic, but it depends on which land use permit is required as to when it gets kicked into HPO. If there is a concern about that, they certainly can make that concern known to, D, to DEP and DEP may request advice from the Historic Preservation Office because they're sister agencies and same same umbrella. Right. So they should be able to do that. Um, typically, if the department hears a lot, they usually will respond. Ultimately, you may not like the response, but they usually will try and like at least see what the issues are going forward. But it really depends on what permit they're what you're talking about um, because then you can call the State Historic Preservation Office and say, this is the permit we think they're applying for, and is there a regulatory review that would involve historic? And if so, here's our concern. Right. I, I see that more often come, to, come into play when a development proposal is not popular in mm -hmm. the community, and there's an historic element to uh, that, that may be adversely impacted, and then it would get kicked over to SHPO and they have an opportunity to review, and mm -hmm. they may be looked upon by the community as an opportunity to, to um, slow down or, or, or oppose the project. Yeah, I mean, the one, I think the one big difference between historic rules and environmental rules is depending on what you come in under, what permit, historic preservation generally takes a lot of people's opinions into consideration. We, we are a program that um, is more grassroots oriented, Whereas in the other side of DEP, I think they have more stricter regulations in terms of uh, it's black and white as opposed to us in the shade of gray. And also when it comes to preservation, there are, there are lots of compromises that can be made that will still result in a preservation. Maybe not everything everybody wants, but if you can get parties together, there, there's usually some sort of common ground unless there isn't, but you know, typically that's what you're hoping for. Um, but that is one big difference with preservation from the environmental community. We, because of section 106 and the federal regs that have come down, that's really based on public participation. Like if the public comes forward and is very upset about something, they can have the opportunity to sway how a project goes, um, depending on the situation. It's just a different origin from some of these things. Right, which, which makes it interesting that the historic state historic preservation office is in 
is a, is a division of mm -hmm. the Department of Environmental Protection. But it's fairly unique. It's fairly yeah, unique. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, a question from um, a, a member here that are any of the um, scenic byways in New Jersey that are, are state designated um, featured on the Journey Through Jersey website? Not as a byway, but you know, that's a really good suggestion. We have talked about that because of the way we set up the site, it was very much a site by site specific. But um, if you're talking about itineraries and how people visit things, then we do need to incorporate the scenic byways into that because that is very much um, attraction for people. They are looking at that. Um, so that is probably something we could do through our blog um, we do have a blog on the site um, and probably something that we can highlight in that way, but we do need to talk about that, I think, internally on that web on the website design about that. We're right now trying to figure out how to incorporate itineraries into the web, web, web website because in the tourism world, having it mapped out for you, like while you're here, you can also do these other things. So we're trying to um, get some of that going um, to make the site a little more interesting and a little more usable to the tourists. Again, thinking that the site is supposed to attract people from out of state, not just right. in-state. You can be an in-state tourist too, it's okay with us, but um, we are trying to have a larger attraction. But well, I think that's a really good suggestion, actually. I'm gonna write that down, that we really need to talk about the scenic byways. Great, great. Well, that gives me an opportunity to plug an event of ours this, this coming Sunday. Uh, we do, which is very related to what we're talking about, uh, we do a series of car treks in association with the sports club, uh, sports car club of America. And um, you know, here at the coalition, we try to meet people on in, in, in the ways that they do what they do. And over the years, well, we, we designed 75 mile routes through, we, we try to bring people to the most places where they'll say, I can't believe this is New Jersey. <laughs> and we've, we've done about 10 of them now. We're doing one this Sunday, 10 a.m. We meet at um, Valley Shepherd Cream, uh, Creamery in Long Valley, and uh, we bring you through really the most spectacular natural beauty of the Highlands, plus also the cultural um, um, uh, resources that are significant. And um, anyone's interested, go to our Facebook page. I think Zach is putting a, a link to it in our chat right now if they want to find out more information. Um, but we believe that um, the history of this area is, is fascinating, which uh, brings me to, I mean, I think we're really fortunate here in Northern New Jersey and in, in the Highlands that we have the Morris Canal. I mean, that really uh, was the first uh, east-west superhighway for the northern part of the state. And um, at the time, uh, 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 what was at one time a very vibrant um, iron industry was, was almost died because um, they were all fueled by charcoal. And by the mid, mid 19th century, there was barely a tree left. And the Morris Canal was, uh, was able to uh, allow us to leverage coal from uh, Eastern Pennsylvania and revitalized the industry and it really established the growth patterns of most of uh, Northern New Jersey. And even though that only lasted about 50 years, uh, it was supplanted by the railroads. Uh, today, there is a very active uh, um, effort for a Morris Canal Greenway, which is a recreation and, and heritage trail uh, connecting um, the Delaware River at Phillipsburg with the Hudson River at uh, Jersey City across New Jersey. And there's great connections, thematic connections between all these towns that are part of the Greenway um, and connects us with our history and, and through recreation. And we're really fortunate that we have this. And it's become a driver for a lot of um, local um, preservation efforts mm -hmm. and interpretation efforts. We've, we've funded piece of it all the way through, um, either for interpretation 
or a lock tender's house or the actual lock or the park that's left um, and trying to clear that out. So we, the trust has had various points along the way, has, has had funding, not for the entire length of it, but just bits and pieces um, as we've been requested for funding. And it's, it's really a unique resource um, from a historical and technological standpoint, because when you think about the height difference between the Hudson River and Jersey City versus Phillipsburg and how that canal had to negotiate these heights and get, get their goods all the way over to the river, it's, it's fairly amazing. I mean, it's no one, you just, the average person doesn't think about that today. Yeah, the, the, the series of inclined mm -hmm. planes that would allow them to bring a, a canal boat 100 feet to the next level rather than the 10 feet that a, that a standard lock would do. And that these were developed with you know, the tools that they had and hand shuffles uh, when this was built in the early part of the 19th century. It really is an incredible story that we were mm -hmm. able to build this thing and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and successfully operated for as, as long as it did. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing resource. Yeah. So another question, um, what opportunities remain uh, for you to work with church properties mm. um, since we had that re uh, not too long ago decision uh, where so many beloved historic properties need restoration are in New Jersey. So many of these churches are, are here. So it's a sore subject. We still haven't gotten over it, quite frankly. Um, we have had some conversations that maybe there was an opportunity to develop a separate funding source, if not from the historic trust, but maybe a, like a third party, similar to how Sacred Places um, has some funding for churches. So we have discussed trying to develop another pot of somehow to be able to help, but it would never be on the scale that the historic trust funded religious properties up till the Supreme Court decision. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to mention to everybody, you know, there's been a huge push in the National Register to, um, to recognize underrepresented history, like African American history. And when you think about where a lot of the African American sites are, oftentimes it's in churches. That's where the congregations had their meetings and often what's left of a community um, in terms of uh, recording its history. And it's the one we can't fund it. So it's like, on the one hand, we're trying to recognize and preserve underrepresented histories, but a large part of that history is something the Supreme Court just told us we can't do anymore. So I find that just, just that's a really big disconnect. Um, but it is what it is, and we have to abide by that. And the only thing that I see that would change that is if somebody wanted to propose an amendment to the Constitution, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon. Um, but that's where we're at. And the only thing that we have talked about internally um, and with so much going on, it hasn't really um, come to fruition was trying to create a separate funding stream for churches that would be administered outside a state system if there were a nonprofit to do it. Um, some sort of sacred places kind of opportunity, but you do need the initial funding uh, to be able to do that. But it's a sore point. We haven't gotten yeah. over it yet. Yeah. Um, well, that brings up another point because there are sacred Native American places throughout mm -hmm. New Jersey. Um, to what extent, in your experience, is Native American history represented in um, heritage tourism and in, pres and, and in the preservation world? It's, it, I mean, up till, till fairly recently, not very much at all. Um, you know, it, it, it's, What's happened now is that as people are doing um, archaeological digs, if they need to do ground disturbance at a site and they're uncovering Native American history, I think there's a, um, a lot more sensitivity towards that. I know at the Trent House, they're doing a lot of archaeology there and they have been able to, they have been uncovering earlier period history and they are going to use that um, in an interpretive exhibit. So I think people are more sensitized to that now so that if they do have this history around them and they've uncovered it, um, that they're more likely to want to talk about it and to show it off and not just put it in a box and stick it in a closet somewhere or whatever. But I think there's definitely um, more sensitivity to it. We're, it's, not, it's not heavily done. Um, it, there's definitely a lot of room for it. Um, also too, when you have an archeological site, there's just been a huge, um, op, just a huge push to try and keep it secret because of looters. And so that sort of gets in the way of actually interpreting on um, the place of. 
um, because you don't want to sometimes attract a lot of attention to a site that's far more valuable if someone digs it up, you know, because you really don't want that to happen. So that's been another obstacle, I think, to just interpreting the place, Native Americans having traveled across New Jersey. But that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean you can't be interpreting the Native American history that the state has. Uh, it just means that maybe we don't want to put it on the place sure. <laughs> that it happens. Sure. But, you know, it's not, I think most people think that, you know, the history of, of uh, European, the conflicts between the indigenous populations here and um, the contact with uh, European settlers all happened out West. Mm -hmm. It happened here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were the land grabs, there were the massacres and migrations mm -hmm. and, um, um, and the people that remained who are, uh, trying to get recognized for their um, uh, lineage to the, the original people here. We see that with the um, uh, Ramapo Lenape, mm -hmm. the Muncie-speaking Muncie people. I mean, it's a very interesting, little understood history in, in New Jersey. I mean, there was a vibrant culture here um, that changed significantly, um, you know, when Henry Hudson went up to Hudson for the first time. And, and from first contact. Um, so I, I have a final question. You know, we all, we grew up somewhere. We all feel connected. We all feel it's a special place. We all, you know, feel that there's some history. What, what, what makes a place truly historical and a story worth telling that will, um, compel interest from outside the the place that will bring people what's what what's what's the metric that we have something truly valuable worth showing off so uh, i don't know that it's it's a hard and fast metric um i was listening to someone talk one time that and when it came to preservation if something if a town is um comfortable with their town and they like the way it looks and they like the way they move around in that town and they like the existence and and that's probably going to generate interest from the outside so like if you think of a small any small town in new jersey which has its own character we have so many wonderful little towns that they each sort of have their own flavor that we shouldn't think about, for example, building heritage tourism so much as building the quality of life, because if you're building the quality of life within your town, then people will want to come to it. They'll find it to, to visit. It's sort of like Booton. I mean, I remember Booton from like 20 or 30 years ago looked dramatically different. It's so obvious um, the changes that have taken place there and that the historic preservation community is active there. We were just at Grace Lord Park for a check presentation on the little stone arch bridge. So I just was just had just come through, but I, I couldn't, I didn't recognize it because I had been there for so long and my image in my head was much more of a rundown place than it is now. It just, it's amazing how much progress you've made. Um, but that to me, as I come through there, the things that you're working on and the things that you gravitate to and the reason why you want to live in Bhutan is the same reason that I want to come back and visit Bhutan because I saw some interesting restaurants or I saw a, a shop. So it's kind of like the reason you're doing what you're doing locally is the reason that people probably want to come. I don't know that it's saying it's any one particular thing. It's not like having a bunch of porches in town or having stone architecture. That might be it. That might be a draw. Um, but it's really about that quality that um, and that character that's part of the part of the town's makeup and its development over time. Thank you know, I think understanding the re how the town developed and how its values are um, embodied in the architecture is a very important thing to do. I mean, the, the Boot and Iron Works uh, brought 300 workers from England and they, um, rather than it being the traditional company town where the company owns the property and um, leases it to the workers, they gave them a very attractive, uh, um, inexpensive rate to buy a, 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 a parcel and and build a house that was affordable. And that's how the town developed. And they opened up the first free school in Morris County. Um, and it was the only free public school for 30 years. And, you know, that, that spirit of community 
established the town and it's 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 in the fabric of 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 how it presents today i think it's important to make that connection to to do that to have that level of understanding of the ethos of a community if you can find that i think you got something to work with mm -hmm. i would agree with that well thank you so much again for um uh, um, being with us and, and imparting your experience and wisdom and uh, telling us how we can um, make our communities better places for ourselves and subsequent generations through um, heritage tourism. And um, I'm sure we'll have you again. Um, I'd, like to, I, I'd like to remind everybody that our webinars are recorded. Um, this will be on our a YouTube channel in the next um, couple of days. Um, just go to YouTube, um, search uh, New Jersey Highlands Coalition. And um, we come to our website, find out more about us. Uh, we protect the natural and cultural resources of this incredible part of New Jersey. And um, we'd, um, we'd love you to join us. So on that, thank you everybody. And um, we'll see you soon. Good night, everybody.